Well, clearly this is quite a pleasure, quite an honor actually, uh, to be able to, uh, to give a talk, an, an opening talk at this place. <coughs> to me, it also feels like a throwback to my beginnings. The fact is that uh, 40 years ago, almost to the day, René Tom, the late René Tom, and uh, Ivan Kupka, who is very much alive, although close to 90, uh, invited me to this place to hold forth about resurgence and related topics. Uh, the, the two gentlemen were kind enough to see merit in my lucubrations, and they even uh, offered practical support. René Tom offered to get my things typed by uh, a secretary here at the Institute. There was even uh, Dennis Sullivan on that day in the, uh, in the room. He showed his appreciation uh, in his own way by reclining on the floor full length, but with eyes wide open, mind you, so that he could uh, follow my scribblings on the blackboard at an angle. So, uh, so nice to be here and uh, nice to reconnect with these memories of long ago. Before, Before starting uh, for good, let us get a few reminders quickly out of the way. Resurgent functions, of course, live in three models, in the formal model as formal power series, um, or more general things, train series, a mixture of power series, of powers of z and exponentials, of um, towers of exponentials. And then they live <coughs> with the convolution model, with the operation be, be, uh, being path convolution. Um, and then in the um, geometric uh, model, uh, as <coughs> sectorial germs at the, excuse me, I got a sore throat, as sectorial germs at the infinite. <coughs> So we start from the formal model, we want to get to the geometric model, and but all the work and all the difficulty manifest in the intermediate model, in the uh, convolutive model. So um, <coughs> the singularities in the uh, convolutive model are responsible for the divergence. And um, moreover, they carry <coughs> important information because um, they carry the Stokes constants. So it is important to measure them precisely. And the tool for doing that is uh, the so-called alien derivations, um, which are the hallmark of resurgent functions, actually resurgent functions or functions which can, uh, um, which can submit to alien differentiation. Uh, the, um, the alien, de <coughs> they, they have indexes, indices, omega, which can, um, uh, which belong to C, or actually the uh, C, uh, the ramified version of C. And the, uh, by definition, <coughs> the alien derivation of a, a delta sub omega applied to phi of zeta is a weighted uh, superposition of various determinations over zeta plus omega. This is defined without difficulty close to the origin and then we move, it is extended. Thank you, uh, I'll use that. Uh, this is extended in the large by analytic continuation. So um, uh, they are defined like everything else in the convolutive model, but by pull back the uh, extend to the uh, multiplicative models and in those two models, we have the uh, additional invariant uh, alien derivations denoted by this, uh, by the double struck uh, delta. Um, they are defined as the usual alien derivation the width in front of them. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, an exponential factor, and that makes them um, uh, those invariant alien derivations commute, which. Uh, uh, with the diff ordinary differentiation relative to z, which is very useful. So, uh, and of course, they have no equivalent in the, uh, in the convolutive model. So, um, the most two important notions, objects that can be attached to a given resurgent functions, 
or the uh, active Aryan algebra in the display. Take um, a recursion function or an algebra of such functions, then take the completion of that with respect to alien and ordinary differentiation, then take the ideal of all alien derivations that kill that uh, uh, completion, that completed algebra. This is a, a bilateral uh, ideal. And then take the quotient of all alien derivations by this ideal. This, by definition, this object might actually reflect the concrete mode of action of alien derivation on that algebra. So uh, to that extent, it is essential. And the uh, thing is that although by themselves, on their own, uh, alien derivations are totally free, un totally unconstrained. In concrete situations, they are anything but free. They are, um, most of the time, they actually turn out to be equivalent to be isomorphic to algebra algebras of ordinary differential operators. So we'll see many instances of that. And then there is a display. It is a sort, as you can see on the formula, it is a sort of uh, alien tail formula. Uh, but um, the main uh, property and the, uh, the main use is actually that of extending any relation between um, <coughs> any number of um, Resurgent function, take any relation R uh, in, involving the uh, plus minus composition, ordinary derivation, etc., and uh, it automatically carries over to the displays, which is extremely useful because this, uh, the second identity involves a huge number of constraints. Um, so it is extremely useful to prove independent theorems and th that sort of things. So, now uh, let us start in earnest uh, for, um, for orientation and for perspective. Let us uh, comment on, a f let us examine on a double column <coughs> the main uh, similarities and uh, differences between uh, equational resurgence and co-equational resurgence. This is going to be our, our main topic today, especially the second column. Equation of resurgence is relative to a, a critical variable, the variable of an equation. Coequation of resurgence is relative to a critical parameter. In both cases, the active alien algebras are uh, isomorphic, as I said, um, to algebras of ordinary differential operators. <laughs> but in the second case, for coequation of resurgence, this algebra actually splits into two parts. Then, um, correspondingly, for equation of resertion, there is one set, uh, one system of alien uh, uh, different uh, equations that describe the whole situation. One bridge equation. For coequation of resertion, th uh, there are two of them, two systems, and very different ones. Then, on the, for with with uh, equation resurgence, we have a real Stokes constants that can assume any complex values, and they are usually transcendental. With uh, equation resurgence, this is perhaps the main surprise, the main difference. Uh, this, uh, instead of that, we, ha we get a discrete uh, Stokes constants, which uh, we call test very specific objects. They, they, they assume only, I mean, uh, after renormalization, they, they will be integers. We call them the tessellation coefficients. <coughs> um, then equation resurgence, well, as I said, every, all, all the work, all the proving has to be done in the convolution model. But with equation resurgence, convolution is ordinary convolution. For uh, coequation resurgence, it is a uh, not a binary operation, but a multiple uh, convolution and a weighted one. There are weights attached to it. And it is a much more uh, 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 quite different operation. For, uh, and then, <coughs> as I said, the, uh, with equation of research, the uh, differential operators, which are equivalent, which are uh, to which the uh, active alien algebra is isomorphic. These are 
They can be anything. They are not constrained. With uh, coequational recessions, they are heavily constrained. They verify, they, they kill uh, a certain two form, which we call the isographic form. And then uh, with equational recessions, the sums in the geometric models are ramified at infinity. In the, uh, with coequational recessions, they are either uh, not ramified at all or finitely ramified. And uh, so they, they, display, they exhibit this uh, very uh, unusual combination of divergence, of uh, being resurgence in various sectors, and uh, being an entire function. Uh, we call them, and there's more to that, we call them autark function. And then uh, the last difference, of course, with equa equation resurgence, everything is 10 times simpler and more straightforward than with coequation resurgence. OK, so let us go. <coughs> so very briefly, and uh, let us uh, review uh, equation resurgence, not for its own sake, but as a counterpoint to what is uh, to coequation resurgence. Take uh, any equation, differential, uh, nonlinear, differential, difference, composition equation or general functional equation, and then uh, form its full, uh, its full solution with the maximum number of parameters in it. Then as a rule of thumb, you can say that um, the, the existence side by side in this uh, equation of powers, inverse powers of z, and uh, exponentials either of z of powers of z, uh, points to the existence of uh, Resurgence. Actually, there will be uh, as many critical times as there exist blocks in palette set powers inside the exponentials. Mercifully, in most situations, there is only one critical time. But if there are more than one, then we can live with that. There is an apparatus to deal with that. Simply, there are many. Uh, we have to consider to go through many model planes, and the <coughs> um, we first to classify the critical times from slower to faster. And then we go through the Borel planes uh, by means of operators which uh, resemble Laplace operators, but with a different and more sophisticated kernel. So uh, and then <coughs> there is a few, uh, once we've got hold of the uh, formal solutions, there is a purely uh, formal, um, there are purely formal manipulations which tell you which alien derivations are going to act effectively on that. And uh, for forming the uh, homogeneous differential linear homogeneous differential equations, which the alien derivatives are going to verify. And uh, following this line of reasoning, we arrive very quickly at the bridge equation, which consists of three things. You see, in the, uh, on both sides, the, the full solution with uh, the maximum number of parameters. On the left-hand side, the uh, invariant uh, alien derivations. And on the right-hand side, the uh, ordinary differential operators in, in the parameters, precisely, in the parameters of the equation, and sometimes also in the variable itself. So. Um, these operators carry the source constants that they as coefficients. Otherwise, they are subject to no other constraints than making sense. That is to say, they must pair off uh, uh, similar exponential on both sides. So you see, uh, this, uh, this reduces the part of analysis to the minimum. It makes everything more or less formal. And uh, we arrive, so in this case, the uh, nature of the uh, active alien algebra is obvious. It is simply the native uh, alien algebra generated by these R, uh, these R sub omegas, I mean these ordinary differential operators. So, uh, no, the, uh, so in, in this case, <coughs> uh, just two remarks. In this case, the display 
uh, it looks like a magnified, actually, uh, full solution because the, the power series in it are going to be more or less the same, but there are two differences. First, the caddy in front of them, Stokes constants, and then that indexation. See, I recall the definition. Instead of being by simple uh, frequencies, by simple omegas, they are in the, the indexation is by strings of omegas. So it is a much richer object. And then it has this property, which I mentioned a minute ago, of extending to all relations. So this is, uh, a, it is a, a, an object which has no classical equivalent and which is extremely, I cannot overemphasize I mean, uh, emphasize this enough, and this is extremely useful. And then uh, just a remark, a, a funny remark, I mean, resurgent functions, I mean, in this case, in the case of, uh, in all cases, in fact, they have a, a, a cohesion which ordinary uh, uh, solutions of differential equations do not have and cannot have. Uh, in the sense that uh, knowing one part of the full solution can uh, constructively uh, co uh, lead to uh, the, uh, the reconstruction of the whole solution, even of the original equation itself. Uh, you can think as an analog of uh, uh, an irreducible polynomial of a Q. If it is reducible, I mean, knowing one root will not tell you anything about the whole, the other roots. But if it is uh, fully reducible, of course, you can, you know, the full picture, you can reconstitute the full polynomial from one root. So they, they cohere and they, uh, they have this property. Now, let us, uh, <coughs> to better understand the interplay between equational and coequational resurgence, we are going to focus on a problem, a model problem, which manifests uh, both types of resurgence. Uh, see, we, we start from the equation, the blue equation with a, a small t, time variable, a system of new equations, uh, nonlinear, and uh, with uh, in front of the system, and possibly in the other coefficients, a perturbation parameter epsilon. Now, it is uh, convenient in the, uh, to switch to the critical variable and to the critical parameter and to work at infinity instead of the, the origin. So we move from t and epsilon to z and x and the system becomes the red system down here. So let us take a long, we are going to work on that uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, so let us take a long look at this <laughs> system. It's, I reproduced it here in, in any case. and. Uh, uh, just one remark, actually. Uh, <coughs> we can assume without actually losing much that the per um, perturbation parameter is absent from the coefficients b. Um, its present there would, wouldn't add anything of substance to the analysis. It would simply complicate notations. And, uh, uh, and then a second remark, there is a special case in which uh, a very special case, I mean, a special, I mean, the coefficients b that reduce to uh, um, negative power, I mean, to one over z, to a constant over z. In that special case, the two, the variable <coughs> and the parameter coalesce into a product z times x. So in that case, obviously, the two uh, resurgences uh, coincide. So something of this uh, sameness is going to survive in the general situations. But on the whole, it is fair to say that the differences are going to dominate. So uh, instead, of, uh, um, instead of working with a full solution, actually, we are going to work with an object which is information equivalent, but more flexible. It is a, a formal automorphism, which the normalizer, which takes the normal form of the equation and its uh, trivial normal solution to the equation, it, to the system itself, and its non-trivial solution. So um, this, uh, this normalizes direct and, in, uh, and reverse consist of two ingredients. 
uh, ordinary differential operators d that encode the Taylor coefficients of our, um, our system. And then uh, the main object from the point of view of resurgent of analysis, they are biresurgent monomials. So you see uh, down here in, uh, in, in blue, they have a, a double indexation, a two-tire indexation. The things in uh, upstairs mean they are uh, weights, complex numbers, and downstairs the Vs are simply analytic germs at infinity in the, on the Riemann sphere, with uh, analytic continuation to the whole Riemann sphere and possibly any pattern of uh, singularities there. So uh, again, I reproduced, they are going to be our main object. And the, um, so uh, just uh, a short aside, I mean, this is useful terminology. These uh, normalizers, they are, I just, uh, just said that they are automorphisms. And this, is, uh, this reflects there being uh, the contraction of ordinary, uh, ordinary derivations, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Ds, and uh, a mold, I mean, the, uh, these uh, biresurgent monomials, which are symmetrical with respect to the uh, indices. Symmetrical simply means that they multiply according to the shuffle product. And the, uh, um, the algebra, I mean, equivalent to that, I mean, the, uh, is uh, alternate. Instead of uh, multiplication, you get zero here. And this is a contracting symmetry with uh, derivations, you get an automorphism, and contracting alternate with uh, ordinary derivations, you get, again, a formal derivation. So this is uh, all our um, indexed objects are going to, be, to fall into one of these two categories, and we are going ag all the t I mean, every time to contract them so as to get either automorphisms or uh, derivations. So, um, so very quickly, I mean, uh, these, as you can see, uh, above the biresurgent monomials, which I should say, I mean, they, uh, this has to be justified, but actually the fact is that they carry they are simple objects, I mean, uh, but they carry the whole uh, diversions once and the resurgence, once they have been understood. I mean, in a sense, everything has been understood. So we are going to focus on them. They are defined by this uh, equation too. And uh, in this case, I mean, coefficient, in their case, in this instance, equation resurgence is simplicity itself. Borel from, uh, takes you from z to uh, zeta as a con uh, conjugated variable, and the recursion equation I mean, simply actually simplifies. You can see equation two. So this uh, equation three I mean, immediately give you all the information about the, the uh, equation of resurgence in this case. It tells you exactly which alien derivations are going to act on that and how they are going to act. They are going to produce elementary, uh, uh, sorry. So equation resurgence is, um, is a trifle in this case. Now, co-equation resurgence is quite a, uh, you see, in this case, the recursion equation, instead of simplifying, uh, gets messier. Uh, we get uh, equation it transforms I mean, when we perform Borel from the x to uh, xi, the conjugated variable, it becomes a partial differential uh, relation which with um, suitable limit conditions. And uh, it is in the case of uh, depth one, I mean, the solution is obvious, but for larger depth, uh, there is no simple formula for uh, solving this recursion solution. So we'll need a new operation, which is precisely the weighted convolution. Uh, so um, actually, to uh, again, for perspective, let us say what we uh, say in advance what we are going to do. We need four things. We need a weighted convolution to express the bioresurgent monomials uh, with respect to x. Then uh, 
to express their own alien differentiation, uh, derivations, we are going to need a second type of uh, weighted convolution. This time it will be uh, symmetrical, uh, alternal with respect to the index. And then we'll need um, exact formulas for finding the alien derivations of these two types of uh, weighted convolutions. And then to express a tree, the alien derivations, the alien deri uh, derivatives, we need a new object, which is one of the, uh, the stars of this theory, the tessellation coefficients. So this is, uh, this will be, uh, will so first the uh, symmetrical convolution is given by a very complicated and uh, um, multiple integral with a complicated multipath and uh, it is very nasty in a sense, very contorted, very, uh, but uh, all the, uh, uh, the fact is that all the calculations for, for coequation resurgence are going to be based on that. So we have to live with it. And, uh, but I can, uh, we should have, uh, we should actually put, mark a pause and describe this integral. You see, uh, upstairs there are uh, weights and downstairs there are germs in the uh, Borel plane at the origin, which have um, infinite continuation, but usually highly ramified. These are the inputs. The output, this is a statement, is exactly of the same type. In germ, the analytic germ, they're the origin with endless continuation and ramification. Um, so we cannot describe this integral in more detail, but we can give a, a more telling, actually, characterization. Just, I mean, uh, just like ordinary convolution is the Borel uh, image of ordinary multiplication. Uh, in the same way, weighted convolution is the Borel image of, a, um, let us say, a weighted multiplication, which is a simple integral kernel this one here. And of this formula, although it is not a, it doesn't, uh, it is of no practical use. Actually, all the work has to be done in the convolutive plane, the Borel plane, but from it's uh, a nicer picture. And it has the advantage, the merit at least, of making a symmetrality obvious because the kernel itself is uh, quite obviously symmetrical. So now, um, as I said, we need a second to get a closed system that expresses everything. We need a second type of uh, convolution, this time alternal with respect to the indices. It can be defined in any of three ways, either as a superposition, as a finite superposition of symmetrical convolutions, or um, by a direct um, integral formula, which is even more complex than the last one we've seen, or again by in the multiplicative plane by a simple kernel. And this kernel, as you can see, I mean, uh, uh, the first convolution is called uh, we call a second willow. And I'm sorry, but we have to, to introduce these objects. We cannot do without them. And the uh, uh, going from one to the second, uh, from the first to the second actually doesn't involve uh, uh, significant complications. Uh, so, uh, again, I have to be content with the uh, so, so somewhat uh, schematic uh, survey, but um, the aim is to, uh, to, get, uh, to, to, to show that there exists a machinery for uh, dealing with the uh, old situation, not so that we don't, we're not condemned to deal with uh, special case after special case after special case. Uh, which is not a very inspiring way of doing mathematics, but I think something that deals with coequation resurgence once and for all. So, uh, what is the relevance of these uh, two uh, convolutions? Well, the, uh, by, uh, the first one, the symmetry one, uh, it's quite simply that the body resurgence monomials with respect to x can be expressed in the, the Borel transform in the xi plane can be expressed as uh, weighted convolutions of what? 
well of these uh, of, of these germs. Now this is uh, rather strange. You see these germs, Ci, the, we are C is in the Borel plane, but it is uh, from it is built from data which originate from the multiplicative Z plane. So we have this very unusual and uh, rather unpleasant I mean, uh, jum uh, jumble of uh, two structures, multiplicative and convolutive. This is of the essence, actually, of uh, uh, co-resurgence, um, co-equation of resurgence. We cannot, um, this is how it is, actually, we cannot help it. And um, the, re uh, the relevance of the second uh, weighted convolution is simply that we we'll need that to uh, express the uh, alien derivative of the first type of uh, weighted convolution and also the second type. This time we, we don't need a third one. Uh, it's, I mean, the, the buck stops there. I mean, we get a closed system. Now, um, now the, uh, this, all this is fine as far as it goes, but it leaves the main uh, uh, difficulty unresolved. I mean, the thing is, how do we um, calculate the alien derivatives of these weighted convolutions. Now the first the idea would be actually, well, well, we might look at the integral formula and then take the endpoint close to a singularity and then look, see what happens. But actually it would be the height of madness actually to proceed in this way. Because just look, e even in the case of ordinary convolution, the, uh, as soon as we move away from the origin, the integration path, I mean, uh, has a way of uh, getting impossibly uh, contorted and, uh, well, uh, convoluted. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is because we must not only dodge the singularity themselves, but also the mirror image, images of the singularity with respect to the midpoint, to the point I mean halfway between the origin and the endpoint. So this is, uh, uh, and this is for ordinary convolution. Just imagine what it can be for a weighted convolution because it is, again, it is a binary, uh, the arity, r, the number of uh, the depth, is uh, irreducible, meaning that uh, a um, weighted convolution cannot be broken down into a chain of binary operations. It, is, it has to be taken uh, directly in its, in its full horror. So uh, we must come up with something else. And the, the only um, salvation, at least, to find a set of uh, test functions which must meet two, three conditions. They must be uh, <coughs> um, they must be numerous in our factory to, to model the general ramified functions. They must be, see, they must be stable enough to, to self-reproduce under all the operations, convolution and alien and weighted convolution. And then they must be, uh, again, simple enough uh, to, uh, to lend themselves to alien differentiation in, term, in, the, I mean, in terms of themselves, again, to get a closed system. Fortunately, there is a, such a system is at hand. They are the uh, hyperlogarithm. And, um, but again, I mentioned when, uh, this feature, this uh, interference of the multiplicative and the uh, convolutive structure in the coefficients. And uh, it, it, I mean, in actual fact, the hyperlogarithm was specially suited for that purpose because they are stable uh, uh, with respect to convolution and with respect also to ordinary pointwise multiplication. But there is a, there is a hitch here. Um, we need to uh, different index. We will have to juggle two types of indexation because convolutions mean adds singularities mean in projection, whereas pointwise multiplication of obviously keeps singularities in place. So we'll need uh, to I mean to use both the so-called positional indexations, which reflects the position of the singularities themselves, and uh, incremental indexation, which measures, I mean, indicates the, uh, div the gap between one singularity and the next when they are on the... Okay. Now, um, unfortunately, when everyone is uh, uh, very familiar with hyperlogarithm, but here it's a question of, I mean, they, they are 
capable of many indexations and many forms. I mean, here we need a very special uh, two, uh, two indexations, and uh, we cannot uh, spend too much time on that, but uh, uh, the formulas are there. And uh, there's a whole set of formula which will uh, be of constant use in the stake wheel. Um, there are formulas for, um, um, for finding the uh, alien derivations when we, um, they are elementary. You see, when uh, under alien differentiation, when the hyperlogarithm when taken in this basis, behave in exactly the way they, they produce uh, elementary Stokes constant, the, the, the red objects, with, uh, and they are the logarithms themselves, the hyperlogarithm or symmetral with respect to their indexes, and the uh, uh, associated monics, the Stokes constants, are alternal with respect. So that will need uh, all the time. And, uh, and there uh, we also need to know exactly how they behave under ordinary partial differentiation with respect to the indices. There are formulas for doing that. And then the, uh, the jump rules, the way they have been defined, these monics are um, piecewise analytic functions defined on a finite number of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, c to the r. And uh, we know the hypersurfaces which limit, which limit these uh, various domains of uh, analyticity. And we need jump rules uh, to describe the uh, passage from one domain to the next. So these are, these are the tools. Now, uh, the first main uh, set of formula, when we, uh, when we consider a weighted convolution with si the simplest possible inputs, ordinary simple poles, uh, what we get is uh, far from simple. You see, depending on uh, how I wrote here the first, uh, for the depths one, two, and three, we get a number of terms. Uh, we can express everything in terms of a superposition of uh, hyperlogarithms. I mean, uh, in total, there are uh, well, quite a lot of them. Uh, the so-called odd factorial, one times three times five times etc., to r minus one, and uh, uh, you see that the the u's and the v's, the u's in blue, the v's in red, behave in a very specific way. There is of course an induction behind all this. There are actually two inductions: one which adds ind indices, and one uh, at the end and. Uh, Another which uh, forward going, which I think this is at the beginning, etc. Um, so, uh, but this is not enough. I mean, our inputs are not simple poles. I mean, of course, uh, this would be enough to deal with the case of meromorphic inputs, but we want to deal with all cases. So we want to have a general uh, uh, hyperlogarithmic inputs. Now. Um, there is again a formula for that. I didn't write it here, but it's in the notes, which I posted in my, on my homepage and in, in various papers. Uh, but there is, a, there is a, uh, an important remark here. The inputs themselves, I mean, they are hyperlogarithm, and the output is also a, a superposition of hyperlogarithms, but the inputs have to be uh, inserted in a, um, positional notation, in positional indexation, whereas the outputs have to be uh, noted in incremental uh, uh, indexation. Well, there are tables in my paper. I mean, uh, the, the number of terms which you get is even, uh, uh, is even larger. I go, uh, the, the formula in blue up there I mean, tells you how many, uh, if each of the uh, inputs has, has depth di, this tells you the number of uh, terms. You see, for uh, just to, to, to to understand how complex the whole thing is, how devilishly complex it is, just uh, take a convolution, a weighted convolution of length four with uh, inputs which are themselves hyperlogarithm, each, each of them again of length four. What you gain is close to 10 billion terms. Uh, of course, there is a combinatorics behind it, and uh, the symmetry, symmetrical alternal, makes everything rather manageable. But uh, this is just to say that I mean, uh, following the integration uh, path, the multipath, uh, wouldn't have uh, got us anywhere. We have to uh, develop um, singularity combinatorics. So um, 
there is a formula for, uh, weight, for uh, calculating the weighted convolution of hyperlogarithms. And, uh, to, uh, and uh, since they can approximate anything, we can uh, take the weighted convolution of anything. So uh, now uh, here come the main surprise. I want at least to be uh, able to, um, to describe this very uh, strange object. I mean, the Stokes the, uh, sto the what replaces the Stokes coefficient, the tessellation coefficient, and their essential discreteness. So you see, uh, in a sense, we have everything. We have uh, expressed the, the convolution uh, products in terms of uh, hyperlogarithm, and we know how to alien differentiate them. But here comes the surprise when we take the sum, and they, they are some huge sums, and uh, there's a gap in complexity. And usually such gaps are uh, attended by uh, emergent properties. And here the emergent properties is the emergence of uh, uh, discreteness. Uh, so let us say we have no time. Uh, let us uh, take an example, uh, uh, perhaps at length uh, three. Uh, we get exactly 15 terms. And um, they are all mean, uh, they are hyperlogarithm. And all the indices on top of them have the same length. So we, if we apply an alien derivation of that, I mean, uh, u1 times v1 plus uh, etc. u3 times v3. We, um, each of the terms is going to contribute something and we have to get the result. We have to replace the high, uh, each of these 15 hyperlogarithms by the corresponding monic. So the x disappears and we have this sum. Now, and, and the surprise is, uh, we know how to partial differentiate these monics with respect to the indices. Now take any u or any v and apply the rules for partial differentiation and you find zero. Well, this is not obvious on this uh, formula, but this is what you get. And uh, all the way to, to infinity. But they are not constant, they are not zero. I, um, uh, if we apply the jump rules, we find uh, this uh, recursion equation in red, which uh, we would uh, I have to explain the notations, but I can take my word for it. The, uh, there are a fine number of uh, uh, domains on which the function is constant, and there are jump rules which uh, amount to an uh, explicit uh, recursion, which can describe the whole thing. And this leads to, um, again, I cannot uh, explain um, in due detail the, the formula, but this recursion rules give, leads to uh, an explicit uh, and simpler expression for the tessellation coefficients. Uh, but they, they have one, uh, you see, they have, they have one effect, actually. They, they are highly polarized. Uh, they, they are simple, they are elementary in the sense that they involve only sine functions of elementary functions, which are uh, homographic in each of the u's and each of the v's. But, um, so you see, this is, uh, we have the choice here between uh, the locally constant and discrete uh, function, these tessellation coefficients, but we have the choice between expressing them as sums of hyperlogarithm, which is slightly incongruous, obviously, but intrinsical, and an expression which is much simpler and more appealing, and also uh, from, pract from the practical point of view, I mean, uh, infinitely preferable but hi uh, highly polarized. This is a situation which is, not, uh, which is not unusual in mathematics, but it is a rather extreme instance of such a situation. And in fact, the simplicity of these, uh, this, uh, uh, of these um, tessellation coefficients is deceptive. Actually, they are very, rather mysterious and highly interesting objects. Just, uh, they, um, there are lots and lots of uh, properties. I just mentioned three. Um, they have this, uh, they are invariant on their, um, they are symmetrical with respect to their indices, they are, they are double indices. They are, um, excuse me, they are alternal. And then they are invariant on their very important involution, the so-called swap, which exchanges upper and lower indices. And that makes them be alternal, mean twice alternal. This is a very important uh, property in arithmetics. 
and the study of multivisitors and all that. And then, again, they are discrete, and uh, for a lot depth one, they are trivial, they are always equal to one, but at a higher depth, surprisingly, uh, they are not constant, but they are uh, almost always zero. If you mean uh, by any measurement, uh, and uh, what else? Well, uh, many other properties. So they, uh, they are quite highly interesting objects. Now, we are in a position with the help of the, these two convol weighted convolutions and with the help of these tessellation coefficients to express, uh, to, to do what we set out to do at the, uh, at the, at the outset, I mean, uh, to express the alien derivations of any convolution product. There are formulas for, for this that involve uh, 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 three things. The, uh, the express, I, mean, I cannot describe them in detail, but the, just I'll say it in words, the, we can express the, uh, any alien derivation, alien derivative of a weighted product as a, in terms of three things, a new, convolute, a new weighted product with new inputs, which are either the uh, um, translates of the old inputs or alien derivatives of the old inputs and, uh, and new weights. So um, this formula exists. I'll have to, to skip them when we should. Uh, yeah, anyway, if you care for that, if we, they are in the, in, the, in the slides, which I posted on my home page. And now, at, the, and now at, at last, we can describe the. Uh, we can give a complete description of the two types of resurgence. Uh, the first, in the first, I mean, in terms of not of the f uh, complete solution, but as, as I said, of the normalizers, which are more flexible. The first bridge equation is quite simple. Um, well, it is uh, one of the standard forms uh, upstairs, I mean, up there, and it involves as usual, ordinary differential operators, which in this case depend on all parameters, including this uh, parameter x. And uh, with respect, it is, uh, it is a constant in z, but it is a, uh, a res uh, an entire function of x. So it describes everything because it can be iterated in terms of itself. So it gives all the information. Not so with coequation or resurgence, because the first uh, equi uh, bridge equation, which we find the second one, looks formally the same, but actually the uh, the cues, which on the on on the right hand side, do depend on x, but not as the entire function, because here x is the resurgence variable, the resurgence variable. So uh, to describe the the resurgence in x of this new uh, object, it takes a third bridge equation which uh, thankfully is closed. It expresses the alien derivations of Q in terms of Q itself. Now this is in the case of uh, holomorphic, uh, de in, in, for the first equation it is uh, absolutely general, no assumption at all. For the second equation, for the equation two and three, we must assume that the data, uh, the Bs, are uh, um, meromorphic if they are not then there is an added complication. There is a new level of complexity. Instead of only Qs, you have uh, two series of uh, new objects, I mean new resurgent objects, Qs and Ps, and they are related by the uh, tessellation coefficients. So uh, again, we would have to uh, uh, describe to look at this uh, uh, calmly and uh, to, uh, we cannot do this here, but the object, again, it was to, to give a, a survey to show that uh, there exists a machinery for dealing with the general situation. So, um, uh, so you see, uh, I'll have to, to, to skip the, the end, we'll just say it uh, very quickly in words, but let us pause a little and uh, take stock of the, uh, what we've um, seen or achieved so far. You see, uh, Contrary to equation resurgence, which is simple enough, although it covers a huge, uh, huge ground, I mean, but it is simple it's, I mean, uh, conceptually and uh, in terms of uh, calculations. 
coequation recursion is a, there, there is a stratification of four level stratification. You see, they are the inputs themselves. They are, um, let us say, they are hyper logarithm. Then we have the con um, weighted convolutions of these inputs. They are huge combinations, I mean, huge clusters of hyper logarithm, again with emergent properties, quite unexpected. And then we have the queues, which are again, I mean, uh, large sums of the, such clusters. And then in the general case, in the ram with ramified inputs, Bs, we have a fourth layer, which again, I mean, the, uh, the Ps and the Qs and the Ps up top, I mean, the last layer. And the passage from the Qs to, to, uh, to the Ps is again mediated by the tessellation coefficients. So, um, um, then again, some uh, I mean, differences. I mean, for equation returns, we'd all need to assume that the, uh, that the inputs B had to be germs at infinity. I mean, uh, no, um, in the case of co-equation resurgence, we had to assume that they, uh, they were in the multiplicative plane. Um, they admitted endless continuation with, again, uniformity conditions. And then in the, uh, for the first bridge equation, the index reservoir is simple enough. It's ju it just, uh, it is generated by the multipliers, by the lambdas here in this equation. In uh, not so with coequation resurgence, it is much more complex. It is uh, the bilinear expressions of the weights and the singularities of the inputs. So you see, um, but to make up for that, the uh, source constant simplified. They become I mean, the uh, tessellation coefficients, which are uh, so th there is a trade-off between uh, the complexity of the uh, um, set of uh, omegas of a active alien derivation and the complexity of these Stokes constants. And then uh, well, many other properties. But I want just to say in, in, in a few words, there, there are only five minutes left. Um, the two, um, uh, what is the matter actually with autarky and uh, with isography and autarky? You see, in, in the case of coequation resurgence, um, we have um, the Qs are, the Qs and the Ps are re resurgent functions. But um, you can imagine that they are, they stand in close relations with the, with the A's, the A sub omegas of the first bridge equation. Um, because remember, there is a case when both coincide. And so in the first case, they are, entire function of x. In the second case, they are um, resurgent function of x. And they are not exactly the same, but they, uh, there is a close relation. We go from one to the other, uh, one system to the other. So uh, they have this double property of being entire and uh, resurgent in sectors. So uh, obviously this imposes on the active alien algebra certain constraints, because otherwise, um, there would be a, an effective ramification at infinity. If there is to be no ramification or only a finite ramification, there has to be some constraint. But the, the interesting thing is that this constraint assumed the form of um, um, this form in the each uh, operator in the active alien algebra, each ordinary differential operator kills a certain differential two form, which I called the uh, isographic form. Why? Because it, it, it had to be, to be given a name. And um, so I gave example, I gave three examples and I'll produce a paper hopefully with many more, but of uh, so-called uh, such uh, isographic forms. And uh, then autarky. Well, autarky is precisely this, uh, this property of, um, well, I'll finish on that. Uh, Autarchy. Autarchy is the opposite of anarchy. Uh, autarchy is usually spelled with a K, but I wanted it to rhyme with uh, anarchy. The, uh, you see, it is, 
you see roughly the, the uh, OTAC functions or entire functions with the symptotic behavior uh, in the various uh, sectors is fully described by resurgent asymptotic expansions, which in turn generate on the alien differentiation a closed finite system, the OTA key relations. And uh, so you see, despite being transcendental, the OTA function have a, a, a strong <coughs> algebraic, I mean finite and algebraic flavor about them. And, uh, the, and, and moreover, they, they, they are not uh, freaks of uh, nature. They are quite common, actually. Uh, if you take something at random, of course, it will be anarchic. Uh, uh, but uh, in practice, uh, it will be, I mean, if it is something uh, of any use, it will turn out to be uh, autark. And the, uh, the showcase example of autark is, of course, the inverse gamma function, you see. Yeah, this, uh, it's, uh, on, the, on its own, it's an uh, entire function. But there is, uh, on, on the right side, this uh, asymptotic expansion, which is well known, and which uh, I mean, combines I mean, uh, with the first uh, ramified factor, actually, to destroy the ramification and to produce something which, despite the resurgence, turns out to be uh, entire. And then the, uh, um, the showcase, the instance of um, anarchy is, of course, the xi function, which is associated with the uh, zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, because, alas, there's this, uh, stri this strip um, which uh, defies uh, accurate description. So, um, and the two things mean be, uh, isography, isography and autarky, they are two, they are closely connected. And as you mean, I gave ex uh, three examples, uh, and, um, but uh, the first one, um, in keeping with our, uh, our philosophy, we deal with the bioresurgent monomials. We want, I mean, systematically, as a matter of principle, we want to study the end to solve the difficulties at the most basic level. And uh, so uh, the first example is devoted precisely to the bioresurgent monomials and to this uh, double uh, genus faced uh, nature being entire and being uh, resurgent. Um, so, uh, one more minute, if I may. So, I uh, wanted to say something about the other types of resurgence, but we have no time for that. I just want, uh, I just want to, uh, to mention in uh, 30 seconds um, a spin off, I mean, uh, a fallout of this uh, theory. Um, when we uh, describe the uh, weighted convolutions of hyperlogarithm or um, the tessellation coefficients, you observed certainly that the u's, the weights, and the v's, the singularities in uh, positional notation, interacted in a very specific way. I mean, the u's get, got added cluster-wise, the v's got subtracted pairwise with, uh, not a, a, on the, with uh, additional constraints. And, um, This uh, gives rise, actually, to an interesting theory. This gives rise to four, uh, to the so-called flexion structure, which is actually mean a very uh, informally. This is the, the sum total of all interesting operations which you can uh, obtain by using the four basic uh, flexions operation, which are four flexions, which combine the U's and the V's. The, the W's are uh, two tire indices mean V's and U's, and uh, the flexions mean combine them, tra transform them in, in precisely this way, adding the U's and the, uh, And this um, flexion structure has, contains, I mean, uh, the dual inside the flexion structure is a set of a, a, a certain algebra and a certain group, which are Adi and Gari, which have the properties of preserving double symmetries, which is extremely useful for in arithmetics, for st uh, studying what I call uh, dimorphy. Dimorphy, you can think of it as the property for a set of uh, transcendental numbers of a Q to uh, be stable uh, under two different multiplication tables, which are difficult to combine, actually. To, uh, so um, the multizitters and the hyperlogarithm fall precisely. They are highly interested, highly interesting, and highly useful, fundamental transcendental numbers mean, and they are dimorphic. And this structure, the flexion structure, is extremely useful 
actually to study that and uh, mostly over the la uh, last 15 years or so I've been uh, basically into this uh, into this uh, dimorphic business and so I wanted to mention this, uh, this spin-off and uh, but actually the uh, these uh, transcendental numbers are precisely the typical ingredients the building bricks of the Stokes constants for equational uh, resertions. So in a sense we have come uh, full circle and uh, uh, we have here um, a nexus of uh, objects which is uh, uh, very closely knit and uh, uh, in my view uh, rather harmonious. So uh, time to stop, thank you. So any questions? A couple of questions here. This isographic form which you mentioned, is it bilinear, it's a non degenerate bilinear form? Or? Yeah, it is actually, uh, it is um, even in the case uh, when it, it is not even, when the number of, uh, of variables is, is odd, even in that case it turns out to be, uh, is, uh, to be uh, um, um, a symplectic form. Yeah. But it is not given uh, naturally in that way. Yeah. It, it is not. Uh, this is interesting because there is a, uh, 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 a quite different, I mean, uh, there's also resurgence when, you, when we consider uh, symplectic uh, systems. In certain cases where on top of the uh, resonances or the standard resonances implied by symplecticity, you have other resonances. Then uh, resurgence gets grafted into this but the uh, underlying symplectic structures get grafted onto that and uh, so that the, uh, the A's you see of the, uh, the, uh, in the bridge equation they derive from a potential uh, but they are real, uh, they are uh, continuous uh, so in, in that case also you have uh, the, the, super, the similarity is superficial because in that case also you have um, uh, Resertions constants which derive from a potential, but they are continuous, they are indexed, they are not, uh, there's no uh, um, discreteness about them. So, um, but there is an interplay, but yes, there is a, a symplectic structure behind it, but uh, in a, uh, it presents itself naturally uh, in an unusual form. I gave three examples in, in, the, uh, in the notes. And there's also a short question. This also tessellation coefficients, which has zero plus minus one plus minus two, yeah. 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 Uh, after no. Yeah. After realization, you said that very often zero in kind of feedback measure as a function of some complex parameters and. Let us say, well, um, in in a, in every sense you can think of. Actually, if you take the coefficients at random, it would be zero most of the time. Yeah. Or if you consider them to be a function on the. Uh, on the Riemann sphere, um, yeah, in, uh, right. two to time, in, and you take the Borel, the uh, Borel measure, it will be. Uh, although I didn't actually compute the exact uh, mm -hmm. Borel, uh, but this is absolutely spectacular. Actually, the, uh, 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 I mentioned the uh, the values for the first uh, for uh, depth four. Actually, they are almost always zero. Uh, again, the, the simplicity of these creatures is uh, is highly deceptive. They are, full of, uh, I have to say, they are. Uh, well, at least I don't understand them fully, although mm, they are there. I mean, they are described, and uh, but we would like uh, actually to give uh, to get other uh, formulas for them and uh, to know more about them. So there's a lot of uh, work to do on on, in, on, on the, in this line. More questions? Thank you.